Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I want to watch uh, my clock very closely because I have lots of slides, but I just want to give you a, uh, a quick overview of what we have been doing. So there are three topics I want to uh, uh, present. is vegetation and forest, and then using solutions of Maxwell's <coughs> equations, and then GNSR land surfaces using Kirchhoff's Lee-Merkle simulator with a patch model, and then how to solve Maxwell's equations accurately for scattering by random rough surfaces. So the first talk is the hybrid method of 3D Maxwell's equations for vegetation and forest, and the work were done by Hong Ting Hong and Wai, Wai Hu Gu. So we go back to this problem we have been done for many years, or at least 30 years, and the basic approach that is using the radiative transfer equation, okay? So if you look at radiative transfer equation, the important thing is that you have this kind of medium, and somehow you assume that there is an attenuation rate. That means you look at every particle, calculate the absorption and scattering cross-section, and then you get the average attenuation rate, and then the optical thickness or opacity is this attenuation rate times the thickness, and then given that, you just, the transmission, how much energy reach down to the soil is exponential minus tau. So this equation has been used for many, many years. But then, recently, we have some doubts about this approach, because it seems that this approach assumes that the particles are uniformly distributed. And secondly, we just assumed that the particles is uniformly eliminated by a plane wave. But however, when you look at vegetation and forest, it looks different, because when you look at this kind of structure here, it doesn't seem to be uniformly distributed, and if there is some shielding effect, it doesn't seem that the particles are uniformly eliminated. So, so the two question here is that if I have a long cylinder, then the cylinder will be shielded by other cylinders, and the cylinders are not uniformly eliminated, so why you take the entire cross-section? And the other thing is quite interesting. If you look at this kind of vegetation, if you shine straight lines, right? You shine a straight lines through vegetation. Then the rays, the straight lines, will either hit the soil or do not hit. So where is the attenuation rate? Does it either, if you don't see anything, you can hit the gap, there's no attenuation rate. So, so why should there be an attenuation rate? So what we do is that we want to set up a problem, and then my student is doing this. So set up a width field, right? And then try to calculate the multiple scattering for all these widths, and set up the geometry and the widths. Okay, so what is the approach? The approach is that you first look at a single width plant, and then you solve Maxwell's equation using some complex similar software, and find a T-matrix, okay? And why you do a T-matrix? The T matrix is much simpler than the internal fields. If you look at the internal fields of these objects, very complicated. The T matrix is not as complicated. And then you look at the coupling, the multiple scattering of all these objects using the T matrix. Well, this is known as the 4 Lax multiple scattering equations. And you just look at how the, all the objects are coupled each to each other through the T matrix. So you do the multiple scattering between different plants, and then you do coupling through the T matrices. OK, so this is showing how the steps are done. So number one, you first of all, you can use one HFSS and look at the fields of the plants, let's say a width plant, and at L band, S band, and C band. So as you go to higher frequency, it is quite complicated. But then you go to the surface field, right? So now you enclose the, the plant by a by cylinder, and you look at the surface fields they are not as complicated. So in other words, if I shine a wave on the object, the fuse inside is very complicated. But the way that the object wave in the other objects is only through the T matrix, which are the fuse uh, surrounding, uh, in, a, in, a, in a cylinder, surrounding the object, and it's very much less complicated. So, so that means the interaction are much less complicated than taking into account each individual field inside the object. And that is why you use the T-matrix to simplify the coupling between different objects. So the fields on an encoding cylinder are much less complicated, and the T-matrix is much less complicated. OK, so now we saw three examples. It's very interesting. So now here is actually data looking at a geometry in half a forest, which will go. And we just have a meeting last week. And it says that in the half forest, there's about 15 
trees, 1,200 meters square. This is 17 trees, okay? And the height is very tall, 20 meter. The diameter is 12 centimeter. So we shine an instant wave and using this Goldilocks equation and calculate the transmission on the bottom, on, at the bottom, how much energy will reach the soil. So transmissivity is PR over PI. And then recently, in the meeting, Simon Yu said, oh, I have, a bit, I have a simple formula. T is equal to transmission is one minus the density times height times diameter times sine beta i. Now, so if you use a classical approach, you get 35% transmission. Using Maxwell's equation, you get 66%, much higher. But then if you're using the geometric optics approach, it's 73%. So he was very, very happy that it looks good, the geometric optics approach. <laughs> now you go to a different case. We need a hypothetical case, much higher density of cylinders, maybe corn or something like that. The height is 5 meter, diameter 12 centimeter. And then we use the wave transfer model, only 9% transmission. But if you use the Maxwell, you have 45%. So it's much higher. That means that you have five times more energy reaching the soil than the classical model. And then if you use this, the geometric optics approach, it's very good, right? <laughs> 43%. So everybody is very happy. But then we look at the last example. C band, right? Transfer through grass. So here is grass, high density, very, very small diameter, 0.2 centimeter, length 0.3 meter. And then why try this again? So if you use the rate transfer, you get 7%. You do Maxwell's equation, 54%, right? Eight times bigger. But if you use this simple equation, you get negative transmission. <laughs> so that process doesn't work. So it works out in our cases. So the summary is that the rate transfer approach has been used for 30 years, right? The assumption is that it assumes an attenuation rate, an average attenuation rate. And you can find the optical thickness, and then you get a transmission. <coughs> but then if you look at the other two approaches, like geometric optics, you'll try more. There is no attenuation rate, because if you look at transmission, it either hit the soil or to hit the soil. So you skip this attenuation rate, and basically the transmission is a fraction of rays that hit the soil, and a hit or miss of rays. Maxwell's equation, there's no attenuation rate. If you look at Maxwell's equation, you only have attenuation if the medium is homogeneous. But in trees, vegetation is not homogeneous. So you skip this attenuation business, and you directly calculate transmission. And the other thing that's very important is that if we use the approach here, if we use the old approach, it's very strong frequency dependence because cross section are very strongly dependent on frequency. Okay? But then if you use geometric optics, it's either hit or miss, right? There's, there's no frequency dependence. But then if you use Maxwell's equation, it is somewhere in between. So it's a very, these are all the results that we did, and we try to do more to have more simulations. Okay, second subject is GNS, our land surfaces of multiple elevations. And there are quite a few talks on this method, on this approach, on this, uh, epic, on this uh, more new satellite right? <laughs> sickness. So I will just quickly go through what we do in terms of electromagnetics. So the GNS our geometry is you use the GPS satellite, right, which is transmitted here. And then this is an area, and this is a power reflected. So this is a specular point. And then you calculate the power receipt ratio, and our simulations assumes a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer. Now, this is rough surface scattering, right? So, if you take Professor Sarbani's class this semester, so going over high speed, <laughs> you do rough surface. Now, you do the traditional radar, you have just back scattering, right? And you only have the incoherent field, right? Incoherent field, so he will explain next, next semester. But then, if you look at the GNSR, you have transmitter, you have specular refraction. So specular refraction with both coherent and incoherent field. So now you go to this model. So in the past, people used two models. In one model, it says that just forget about the incoherent field. Just do the coherent field by this expression. It depends on the IMS high H. If you only, and then the incoherent model, it says forget about the coherent, <laughs> coherent field. Just do the incoherent field, either or. Right? Then the power depends on the RM as slope. So one model depends on the height, the other depends on the slope. But we plot this figure 
as a function of RMS height. And we can see that the Korean model and Korean model, although are both used, they are something like 35 dB difference, large differences. So we were puzzled and say that, what's going on? So now we go to this problem here. The coherent model is 35 dB larger than the incoherent model, right? The coherent model depends on the RMS height, and the incoherent model depends on the RMS slope. And it's very important. So we are doing some ground campaign. So we go to the field, do we measure RMS height, or do we measure RMS slope? It's a very big debate. Now then we look at the rough surface scattering theory, it's interesting that although there are many years of rough surface scattering theory, but if you look at any book, it will only consider this kind of geometry. It says that, okay, I have random rough surface, I shine a wave, and it scatter. And basically, it's one elevation. But then if you look at the topography of land over 10 kilometers, there are many, many elevations. So there why, that's why there is also a uh, rough surface superimposed on many, many elevations. So the high function is not one level, but the roughness of one level plus the DEM, right? which is DEM is digital elevation, was topography. And then you notice that if you have multiple elevations by interferometry and all that kind of stuff, will be, there will be phase variations of the coherent field. So what we do here is that, well, let's say that we take this multi-level elevation and we do a brute force physical optics cutoff, right? Okay. So we take a brute force physical optics cutoff and crank out this integral, and the area is 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer, and each discretization is two centimeter, two centimeter. So this is discretized into 250 billion patches, right? And then you just brute force integrate. And the implementation is 40 hours using 20 cores. And what do we get? Well, the interesting thing, the first thing we show is that what is the phase contributed by each patch? Now, if you assume that a single elevation, you will see that there is a Van Nelson effect. That means at the center, the phase is between zero and pi, and then yellow between pi and two pi, and then between zero and pi again, between like, pi and two pi. So it's very regular phase from each scattered part. But once you put in the elevation, because a little bit of elevation destroys the phase, right? So you have a lot of random, random phase. So apparently, the single elevation coherent model is not appropriate. So we do this brute force simulation, 250 billion patches, and we find that result is actually in between the coherent model and the incoherent model. So the Kirchhoff results are larger than the incoherent model and smaller than the coherent model. OK, somewhere four in between. So recently, then we lose, use a simpler approach. So this simple approach is that, actually, it's made more accurate. We divide the whole area into patches. And the patches are, of course, on multiple elevations. And then, in the past, we saw Maxwell's equation, find the coherent field, incoherent field. So for each patch, we look up Maxwell's equation, look up table, find the coherent field, and find the incoherent field, right? And then you just need to sum over all the patches. So SWC is the sum of weighted coherent fields. And then SWICR is the sum of weighted incoherent fields. But now these are at multiple elevations. You just add them up. And of course, after you add up the field, you have to get the absolute value to get square, to get the power. So this is so you first sum coherently, and then you take absolute value. So this is how we use Maxwell's equation to get all the cross sections. Now, then it's very, quite interesting. So you look at this table here. The coherent model have definite phase, right? The incoherent model is random phase. The coherent model depends on height, h. The incoherent depends on slope. And many people look up the literature so that if the coherent field is proportional to area square, incoherent field is proportional to area. But however, if you look at this approach of summation of coherent field, and summation of incoherent field, you find something quite different, particularly for this third column. The summation of very coherent fields, you have every patch is coherent, but when you add them up, the phase is mostly random for most of the cases. So you cannot say that the summation of coherent field is coherent because the phase is random. How can it be? How can it be coherent? So the summation of coherent field is actually phase is random, but it also depends on RMSI H, right? 
So you cannot call it incoherent because incoherent depends on S, MS slope, S. And then the summation of coherent field still depends on RMS high H. That is very important. As I said earlier, when we go to the field, do we measure H, RMS high H, or do we measure RMS slope? And then, of course, the summation of incoherent fields is very much incoherent like this one. Okay? So this is a new idea of summation of coherent fields and then summation of incoherent fields. So that, this is the result. So we have turned on this approach, usually patch model, and the coherent model, the incoherent model, and then the Kirchhoff simulator, and then the patch model using Maxwell's equation of table. And it agrees quite well with the Kirchhoff simulator, but then in a large RMS high case, and it's actually zero dB high end. And we have no time to de elaborate on this. There's some classical theory saying that uh, Kirchhoff is not correct. You need to use Maxwell's equation to get a higher coherent field. Okay. So I'm in good time. <laughs> so I have the last topic. The last topic is accurate numerical solutions of backscattering emissivities for soil and ocean surface using Nystrom and IBC. And uh, GU here is here, Yang Li Du and Tai Kao. Okay. So why do we need to solve Maxwell equation? Of course, we all oh, Maxwell equation is correct, exact. But the problem is how accurate can you solve Maxwell's equations? Numerically, okay, so now, if you go to passive remote sensing, for those who are in the Aquarius mission, I talked to the chief scientist uh, a couple of weeks ago, he says that the accuracy requirement is 0.1 Kelvin. So 0.1 Kelvin meaning that the emissive accuracy is three to the time to the 10 to the minus four, okay? So why, why does he want us require accuracy? Because he want to measure, a chorus want to measure climate change, the ocean salinity. So when the ocean gets less salty, right? If you next time go to the ocean, it's less salty. It's 0.2 part per SU. Then the change in emissivity is very small, right? So for vivo, it's 10 to the minus 4, H4 is 10 to the minus 4, it's all 10 to the minus 4, OK? So accuracy is that can you solve Maxwell's equation numerically to the accuracy of 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4? Numerically, not, not the exact no, uh, solution of simple geometry. Okay. Now, then we go to radar now, right? So our radar, oh, our radar is okay. But it's not okay because you send a radar, send it to the rough surface here. You know that most of the energy go to the circular direction, right? Okay. So the large numbers go to the circular direction. But then when you go to the backscaling direction, it's very small, right? The amount of energy is very small. The comprise is very small, the total energy compared with the total. And then the cost flow is even smaller. Okay. So when you solve the Merkel this equation, you can max well, you can get very accurate solution in this in this four direction. But the back direction, are you accurate enough? So there's also another question about the Merkel simulations. Okay, so now let's look at Maxwell's equations that we are studying, GU, we discussed uh, extensively. If you look at Maxwell's equation, it's a function of x, y, z, right? And you notice that Maxwell's equation is analytical. That means that E and H are C infinity. What does C infinity mean? That means you can differentiate any number of times. It's still okay, right? It's analog, it's, it's analog okay? Now, then you put this uh, Maxwell's equation in three dimensional space onto the surface. When you have on a surface, then you replace Z by the height function, right? Okay. For lateral rough surface, very interesting. I, when I look at this, this thing here, this is not natural. Okay? So the surface itself is not differentiable. When you look at this, this thing here, there are corners. But when you look at lateral rough surface, the high function is also infinite, C infinity, differential any number of times. So when you plug this high function into Maxwell's equation, that means the electric field, electric field on the surface are also infinite differentiable you can differentiate any number of times, it still exists, okay? So there's a property of Maxwell's equation. Now then we go to the numerical method. What is the problem with the numerical method? You set up an integral equation, and then you solve for the electric field, electric field on the surface, right? You set up matrix equation to solve it. So how do you solve this matrix equation? How are the approximations you make? The first thing you make is you write this surface field as summation of pulse function, the simplest, right? Power's function, every interval is constant. So it's not differentiable. So the first thing you write, oh, 
I write this summation of Pauli's function, but it's not differentiable. But Maxwell's equation says it's equally differentiable. And when you replace a rough surface, you will replace by flat patches, right? Or slope, okay? Also not differentiable. So you make two approximations that actually against Maxwell's equation. Because Maxwell's equation is that it's always differentiable, whether you electric field or the high function. But it's not. So the approximation you made is not. And there is the classical problem of the numerical noise, discretization errors, OK? So now when you do this, and you solve Maxwell's equation for a soil surface now, or soil surface, we use very dense, right? 50 points per wavelength, and we solve. And one, how do you check accuracy? You look at energy conservation. This is a very rough surface. The energy conservation is 98% for TE, and 82%. So you can see that something is wrong when you try to. Of course, you can use more points, but the more you find that if you use more points away from these other 50 points, it becomes unstable. The matrix equation becomes unstable. Okay? So it's pure energy conservation. This is energy conservation of function of RMS high height. You can see T is okay, relative okay, but TM is terrible. Then you ask the question, in the classical approach, is there an approach that assumes that Maxwell electric field magnetic field are even differentiable, and the high function is even differentiable? That's it, actually, that's the approach. <laughs> what is the approach called? The approach called is T-matrix, right? So actually, it's also a 25 years approach. So when you do T-matrix, it's very interesting. It assumes the field on the surface is written as a Fourier series. Its Fourier series correspond to plane waves and effervescent waves. Now, Fourier series, everybody knows, is infinite differentiable. You can differentiate any number of times it exists. And then when you solve the integral equation as a function of x, you use exact high function. So there's no approximation. For T-matrix, you use a, a summation. Every term is infinite differentiable. And the high function, you use exact. So you basically go back to the, you know, the Maxwell's equation, electric field are uh, infinite differentiable. The high function is infinite differentiable. So it looks good, right? So we try this T-matrix, actually. I will teach this T-matrix method in 5.0 Felix semester. And what you find is that when it works, it's beautiful, OK? So when you have a small height and 20 constant length, you use T-matrix, the energy conservation is what? 5.9, right? The conservation is to 2 to the 10 to the minus 6. So exact, very, very well. But then when you go to a rough surface case haze, it fails miserably. Why it fails miserably? Because when you have very rough surfaces, you need to use many terms in the Fourier series, which means that you have to use many, many evalescent waves. When you use very well evalescent waves, you require lots of evalescent waves, and the matrix becomes rapidly ill-conditioned because the matrix becomes either exponentially large or exponentially small, and you get to it very poorly. So you only get 64. So the T-matrix actually obey the assumptions of differentiability of both electric fields and the high function. But for the large high case, it gives you very bad answer. So this, let me look up some more people do in the past recently, is that we use the Lystrom method. So Lystrom method is somewhere in between. So what Lystrom method says is that you divide into patches. For each patch, you use a higher degree polynomial, to, which is so you use fifth order polynomial. So it's fifth times differentiable, right? OK. And then when you look at a rough surface, we use a cubic spline to fit the surface. So it's third order. So it's differentially differentiable, OK? So we divide into that intervals. And each interval for the surface field, we use fifth order polynomial. And the high function, we use third order polynomial. And then this is this slow down the process, but we make it very fast using the a method we call the labor impedance boundary condition and the, SF, uh, the FFT approach for fast implementation. So what's the result? The result is that when we do a very rough surface now, very, very rough surface, OK? And then if you use the T-matrix, it's very poor because you need to use a lot of evaluation when you make it unstable. It's 64% to be 6%. You use the pulse, classical MOM, pulse, and point matching. It's quite good for TE. But for TM, it's 8%. But then, when you use the Nystrom method, the poor method proposed, we are up to uh, 4 or 5 times 10 to the minus 4. So we have energy conservation very, very well. So this is the way that we think that we can move forward to do the much tougher problem in rough surface scattering um, using numerical solution of Maxwell's equation to achieve the required accuracy.
So this is what my student young do this. So uh, Joe Johnson is not here, but he we have applied this method to his UWB red, which is 0.5 gigahertz to 2 gigahertz. Ocean, we're looking at the ocean, because ocean you want to measure salinity. So we scan over from 0.5 to 2 gigahertz, and the vaporization emissivity, the exploration, and the energy conservation is very, very good. Right? It's very, very good. Four or five nines in the whole thing. Okay. So this summarizes our, our recent work, the three things. One is vegetation, the other is the uh, GNSSR, and also the accurate solution of uh, rough surface. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. <laughs> Yes, uh, back to the first part of your talk about using the use of the radio transfer approach. Yes, yes, yeah. The can the canopy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that probably one of the maybe the main reason that it's been so popular for decades yeah. for modeling propagation, velocity propagation through um, through canopies, yeah. is because it's really convenient and easy to use. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly a lot easier than doing a formal. Right. 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 Yeah. So, uh, is there a way to use your method to do to come up with some sort of uh, effective, often you know, specific attenuation or something, so that you could, so that yeah. people who aren't specialists in the stuff that you do could use the uh, simplified approach like that and still get reasonable answers? Yeah, I think so. Because what happened is that in the past, when we do the to the to the SMAP project, in the beginning we use a lot of rough surface simulation, and we set up lookup table. So lookup table has been very useful, has been applied to the globally, to all the SMAP radar, but unfortunately SMAP radar only lasts for six months, okay? So we plan to do the same thing, vegetation. We set up lookup tables for transmission. Because if you want to use the optical opacity, you can say that the, the op op opacity is just a natural rock of the transmission. So once we get that, we will provide a table. Actually, our tables also is put on our website. And you can do whatever you like. You can fit in regression to get of optical fitness. But this is just the beginning because we only started this uh, vegetation three years ago because people said <laughs> vegetation use phase transfer. But then the problem with transfer is that you get very strong frequency dependence. Like if you have L-band transmission, suddenly you increase in frequency. Wow, right? The cross section increase so fast that your opacity becomes so large. And that is why we initially, something is wrong there, right? And then when you look at the geometric optics, it's independent of frequency, right? <laughs> so, so geometric optics suddenly very, when I talked to Simon last week, he said, why don't you get a ray tracing code? And let's try ray, ray, ray tracing and see what are the difference in the answer. And you can see the answer is very different. So that's why ray transfer has been mostly used for the Omega Tau model for the L-band. Once you go to high frequency, you can see there's a lot of questions. Just attention is too large, OK? So we would like to do a lot of simulation. My student here turn on the um, super performance computer and crank out this lookup table, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, any more questions? <laughs> All right, thanks very much. <laughs>